Good morning. I'm Sophie Rogner. Welcome to this news briefing from the 253rd National Meeting and Exposition at the American Chemical Society in San Francisco. We're joined today by Dr. Christopher Jewell from the University of Maryland. He will be talking to us about his work on altering the immune system to reverse paralysis. Dr. Jewell? Thank you. In my lab, we're combining material science and immunology to study and hopefully to combat autoimmune disease. And in autoimmune disease, basically the immune system malfunctions and it recognizes incorrectly your own cells and tissue. And so these are diseases like type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, for example, myelin, which lines the neurons in your brain, it gets um, recognized incorrectly and attacks. And so immune cells go into the brain, they cause inflammation and destruction of the machinery in your brain that help you move. So if, if you know someone with MS, um, they slowly lose motor function over, over decades. It's an awful disease for the patient and for their families. Um, and most of the treatments, they do things like um, you know, they might block immune cell migration. That's good because immune cells don't go into the brain and attack the myelin, but it's bad because um, those cells might not be able to go when, where they need to go when there's an infection. So the treatments, you know, they've been beneficial for patients, but they're nonspecific and they leave the um, patients immunocompromised. Um, they also, uh, they're not curative, and to get the effects that they do provide, they have to take those treatments for their entire life. Um, and so there's, for these reasons, there's a lot of interest in generating um, more specific kinds of therapy. So if you go to uh, the, the cartoon, um, in a patient that has MS, they have um, these cells. Uh, so on this cartoon that we made, um, the gray cells are myelin-specific cells, and they're coming into the lymph node. And so you probably know your lymph nodes, they swell up when you get sick, right? That's because those are actually the tissues that make all the immune cells that they can then leave and go to you know, the, your lungs or the site of infection or to a tumor. And so in a patient with MS, you have these cells that are myelin reactive coming into the lymph node, but they haven't necessarily figured out how they should respond to it yet. If they have the disease, so you can see those red cells, those are kind of the bad cells, in the lymph node, they get signals that cause those cells to become inflammatory. Then when they leave the lymph node, they go to the brain, so you can see them up there in the brain, they're actually attacking the myelin. So what we're doing in my lab is we're actually designing polymer particles that we can directly inject into lymph nodes, and we design these polymer particles to be too big to drain out of the node. What that means is as they slowly degrade, they're biodegradable, they release signals that reprogram how the immune cells that are reactive to myelin in the lymph node respond. And so we have these particles release myelin peptides, fragments of myelin, and regulatory drugs that polarize the immune cells. So now you're looking kind of at the top half of this um, lymph node. You've got those gray cells coming in. They see these particles that we've implanted into the node, and they're releasing signals that reprogram their response. So now these cells, instead of becoming bad um, inflammatory cells, they become these green cells that are regulatory. When they leave the lymph node, they then go to the brain, and they actually shut down the inflammatory cells in those sites. And so the goal is that you have a much more specific way to kind of correct the problems in an autoimmune disease where you're attacking your own molecule, like myelin, but you leave the rest of the immune system functional. And so that's really um, what we've been trying to do. And the sort of the, the innovative aspect is that we're programming directly that local tissue rather than exposing, you know, a systemic injection or infusion where the whole patient is getting exposed to, you know, drugs that are helpful for the disease but have lots of side effects and are very strong. Um, so we, we have a couple video clips here. If you go to um, the, the first one, so this is a mouse that has a, a very common model of multiple sclerosis. So if you um, play this, you can see that the mouse doesn't have any function in its hind limbs. There's no function in the tail. Um, there's some loss of function in the forelimbs. And right after this video, we treated um, these mice with these polymer particles that we put into the lymph node. They slowly degrade and they reprogram the response of the T cells, of, the, of these immune cells. So this is the same mouse after we treated. Um, and if you play this one, you can see that there's a large therapeutic effect where the mouse, um, sorry, if you want to go back to that, where the mouse is able to uh, walk and able to stand on, um, on the hind limbs, um, has recovered a lot of the function in the tail. Uh, and so some of the nice features of this, the strategy that we're trying to develop, we just treated a single time at the peak of disease. So we got this reversal of paralysis, and those mice maintain that function for the um, entire length of the experiment. Uh, and so it seems like it's permanent. 
some of the things we're working on now, um, building from, from these studies, which are in a, a certain kind of model that uh, mimics some of the late state, the features of multiple sclerosis patients late in the disease, where they're kind of just continually progressing. Um, what I'll talk about uh, tomorrow when I give our research talk on some of our unpublished work is that we're applying this to mouse models that mimic early stage disease, where a patient gets a little bit sicker, then a little bit better, then a little bit sicker, and a little bit um, but over time, they're progressing. Um, and we're also then applying this to um, type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune disease. So trying to extend it to uh, understand how it might work in other diseases, and then also trying to understand how um, we might be able to control the local lymph node environment for other kinds of applications in immune function. So sort of a more basic ap ap aspect of the project as well. All right, so now we can open this up to questions. And if you have a question, please use the microphone. State your name and affiliation before you're asking your question. Ben Valsler, Chemistry World. Um, I'm going to have to ask a few questions, I'm afraid. It's fascinating work and uh -huh. the, the, the results are really promising. Uh, so how do the modified cells shut down the response? Is that just a, a competition thing or are they actually doing something else to the existing antagonizing cells? Uh -huh. So um, what we know so far is that uh, what we do when we um, treat these lymph nodes, we actually make more regulatory T cells. That's a particular type of immune cell that already exists in all of us. And you know, if you get, if you have an infection, and as you're clearing your infection, your immune system doesn't want to continue exerting all the resources it needs to do that. So it um, has natural mechanisms to calm down. And so, in some ways, we're generating cells that are actually um, naturally there. We're just trying to polarize them away from inflammatory function and towards these regulatory cells. Um, regulatory T cells, they have a variety of functions. They can secrete cytokines or other signaling molecules that act on inflammatory cells. Um, there are ways that they can directly inactivate inflammatory cells. And then, like you said, we're also, um, instead of making inflammatory cells, we're making these regulatory cells. So there are a variety of different ways that this could happen. Um, what we know so far is that we make more regulatory cells, um, not just where we treat, but throughout the body and other immune tissues, and that then in the brain, fewer inflammatory cells go into the brain. Uh, Bela Buslig, ACS. Um, when, uh, when you're injecting these, uh, these particles, uh, uh, do you select just one lymph node? Uh -huh multiple lymph nodes, yeah. or how do you make, uh, make sure that, uh, that there is a generalized response? Obviously, the mouse has had a reasonably nice response because yeah. uh, from paralysis, it, it went to nearly full mobility. Mm -hmm. Yep, so um, we actually got this idea originally uh, because I, I don't, many of you probably know someone who's gotten allergy shots before where you get a low dose of cat dander or bee pollen or something in your arm and you get it like every month and then you get it every, or every few weeks then you get it every month and you build up a tolerance. Um, so there are some clinical trials where these, um, these allergy shots are given into lymph nodes just in a free form, no particles or anything. And so we got the idea that could we combine this idea, lymph, lymph node delivery, with biomaterials where we could design particles that would stick in the lymph node and slowly degrade. Um, and so in people, in these clinical trials for allergies, um, basically it's an outpatient procedure. So um, they get the, these uh, ultrasound guidance, so, um, and they usually get an injection in their leg. Um, and so in the mice, we gave an injection in the leg, even though the site of disease is the brain, and, and the, the data we showed you are from those videos. So, you know, there's a lot of things we would do before knowing if this will be useful in humans, but um, kind of the idea would be you'd get a treatment with these particles, um, probably as an outpatient procedure with ultrasound guidance, or um, it could even be um, some kind of surgical injection just with a, looking at a peripheral lymph node or something. Um, and then the idea would be you'd reprogram this function and generate hopefully good therapeutic effects. Any online questions? All right. I'll just ask a question. I'm Katie Cottingham from the American Chemical Society. And I was wondering if there were any side effects or any unexpected things that happened with the mice um, when you gave them the treatment. Uh-huh, yep, good question. So, um, I mean, the things we've looked at so far are um, more basic because we're first trying to understand the efficacy and, and the mechanism, but um, we've looked at sort of um, gross viability in the cells. We've looked at other, um, not just paralysis, but body condition and weight loss and things like that. And all of these things improve after treatment. 
Um, some of the things that we'd really like to do, and I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of some of our unpublished work tomorrow, um, but if you have a, a mouse for now or a patient in the future and then you treat them and they have good response to disease, you don't want to leave them immunocompromised to you know, some other kind of pathogen. So we've done some more recent studies that, um, where we actually take the mice that recover and we expose them or challenge them with foreign molecules and we look to see if they can mount responses against these foreign molecules like a healthy mouse could. Uh, could. And so in those studies we've seen that that does occur. Um, the next step is to then actually challenge those mice with a pathogen that a healthy mouse could reject and see if we get the same kind of thing. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, I'm just interested in this idea of actually sort of educating cells in the lymph and whether that, how broad an idea that could be. I mean, could that be used as vaccination? Could we genetically screen people who are maybe predisposed to some of these autoimmune conditions? Could it, could it be used in that way? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there, there are lots of people working on that exact idea of um, sort of a, a reverse vaccine or an inverse vaccine where you're actually trying to take advantage of the specificity of the immune system to generate, um, you know, better kinds of treatments for these diseases. So that part is something that, you know, wasn't our idea that meant that's kind of a blue sky goal, I think, for the whole field. Um, there are lots of different strategies people are trying to achieve that. But um, basically anything where you might be able to identify the molecules or specific sets of molecules that are attacked or incorrectly recognized, you could think about trying to reprogram immune cells. And there are different strategies, you know, like biomaterials like we're working on, um, taking maybe cells from the patient, re-educating them outside of the body, then re-infusing them. That's an idea that's being studied in clinical trials. Um, so I think definitely the, the current treatments are, all the approved treatments basically are, are non-specific in the sense that they don't target just diseased cells. They might be different levels of specificity, like maybe they target a certain receptor instead of blocking all immune function. Um, but the, the goal, I think, overall for the field is to move towards more and more specific treatments. Okay, we have an online question from Christine Sa, American Chemical Society. When do you think this, this treatment could be tested in human patients? Yeah, that's a <laughs> tricky question. Um, so like I said, one thing we're trying to understand is the mechanism, and if you some of the questions that, that you'd want to know if you are going to translate this is, are the mice that, are they immunocompromised? Can they mount responses to other kinds of pathogens? And I mentioned a little bit about those. Um, trying it in other disease models to see if you have kind of a robust way to control immune function. Um, and then we're also partnering, we have great collaborators at the University of Maryland Medical School and the um, Baltimore VA. Um, and so we're actually preparing for studies right now to do some work in non-human primates that hopefully will um, have uh, started later this year. So um, I think all the, kind of some more work in mice to understand how things are working, and then also in parallel looking at how well this might work in models that mimic some features of humans a little bit better than a, a simple mouse model. Um, we'll hopefully reveal the answer to that question. Thank you. Uh, ben Vals, The Chemistry World again. Going back to the specificity and, and the uh, the sort of wide potential for this. Yeah. Is this potentially also a treatment for donor organ rejection? If we can find out what it is about the, the donated organ that is causing an immune response. Yeah, um, so the studies we are planning to do in non-human primates will do some work with transplantation. Um, that's the plan to do that. Um, and the, one of the differences in uh, transplantation is there are many types of, you're you know, basically putting a new organ in, so there are many different types of molecules. Um, having said that, there are some ways that you could think about classes of immune molecules or um, types of molecules on the organ you're going to transplant that might let you get some broader protection. Um, another strategy that's being looked at, um, not just by our lab, but others, is just trying to generate more regulatory immune cells, even if maybe they're not quite a, not as specific, but that might help rather than just giving potent immunosuppressants, you know, by IV infusion or injection every day for, for the person's entire life. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential, but also many uh, questions that are open in the field, the kind of strategies we're taking, but also more broadly some of the other strategies that folks are taking. Any further questions? All right, if not, I would like to thank you. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore San Francisco. Please join us for our next press conference today at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time on a bionic leaf that could help feed the world. Thank you. <laughs>